The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine, named after the it's 12, 12 finger breadths long. That's how it got its name from the Latin, apparently, duodenum. Anyway, the duodenum goes from the stomach to the jejunum. This person doesn't have one. We'll find one, there'll be round here, one round here somewhere. We'll look at the pertinent anatomy. That is, we'll look at what the four parts are, because that's how it's described, in four parts. We'll look at the curve around the pancreas. We'll look at the bile ducts and the main pancreatic ducts, and maybe we'll talk about the minor duodenal papilla. Um, Oh, ligament of trites, oh, blood supply, that sort of thing, okay? So not comprehensive, comprehensive, but kind of comprehensive, comprehensive. All right, so I've taken the liver out. Here's the stomach. So the stomach is going to, so the pyloric region of the stomach, the pylorus is going to pass contents from the stomach into the duodenum. We can't see it. We're gonna to have to take a little bit more off. So here's the transverse colon. Pull the transverse colon away. Now we can see the duodenum. If I take away the rest of the small bowel, so jejunum, ileum, what we're left with is this is the duodenum here. And if I put the stomach back, there's nothing left for it to sit on. But you get the idea, right? There's the stomach emptying into the, the duodenum. Here's the pancreas here. Spleen, not really relevant today, but whatever. And the pancreas has been dissected away so we can see the main pancreatic duct here. The pancreas has got two jobs. Well, it has endocrine functions and it has exocrine functions and it's secreting into the duodenum here. This is a wonderfully carefully created model here. The, the duodenum here looks fantastic. We've got a, a number of important structures. The duodenum then is going to continue digestion of the contents passed into it and it's going to begin absorption. Uh, so the small intestine is largely involved in absorbing nutrients from what we eat and drink into, um, into the blood surrounding it. The stomach is highly mobile, which is great because, you know, it expands and distends and shrinks back down again and squeezes and needs to move around. And the small intestine as a whole is also highly mobile. They have mesenteries that allow them to move as, as the contents pass along them. The duodenum then is the most fixed part of the small intestine. It is largely retroperitoneal. It's almost entirely retroperitoneal, meaning that the peritoneum that lines the abdominal cavity, the duodenum has become behind it. It's held, so the pancreas is held in place by the peritoneum. The peritoneum covers it, and the peritoneum also covers most of the duodenum, holds it in place. That's not true for the entire duodenum, but it's a good way of thinking about it. The duodenum is fixed. It's about 25 centimeters long, and is largely C-shaped for some good embryological reasons, but we anatomically might want to think of it as C-shaped because it curves around the head of the pancreas here. So the pancreas, which is a very soft tissue, is butted up into that curve of the duodenum. The four parts of the duodenum then are the first part, the second part, the third part, and the fourth part. So I don't see what all the fuss is about really. Although they could also be called the superior part, the descending part, the inferior part, and the ascending part. Um, should we take each one of those in turn? It won't take long. So the, um, the first part is, I guess logically, the part that leaves the stomach. And it's this part up here, this, this, it also gets, so the first part is also called the superior part. Um, and it's this short section up here and it does have a little bit of a mesentery. And that's about it. Where it changes angle and then it starts to descend, this is the descending part. So this is the second part and this is the longest and by far the most interesting part. The first part is, it about, you can see it's off to the right side here, but it's at about the level of the first lumbar vertebrae. 
this first lumbar vertebra. And then the descending part descends from about L1 to about the level of L3. Well, this is where the curve really happens, but um, the reason it's the most interesting part is, well, uh, there are two things happening here. Inside the, um, the descending part of the duodenum, we find the major duodenal papilla. So a papilla is like a little, little hill, you know? Um, but there's a, there's a tube in there, there's an opening. And this is the, um, okay, so hepatopancreatic are the contemporary terms. Hepato referring to the liver, pancreatic referring to the pancreas. So the liver passes bile into the bile duct. No, it, oh, that's not true either. The liver passes bile down the ducts into the common bile duct and the common bile duct drains that bile into the duodenum here. Actually, when the sphincter here closes, then that bile backs up that duct and then fills up the gallbladder. That's the truth of it. So here, uh, we have, so here, the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct meet and enter the duodenum. Bile is passed into the small intestine in the second part of the duodenum. And exocrine pancreatic secretions are also passed into the duodenum at the same spot. There's a little widening of the tube here, which gets called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Its uh, older name was the ampulla of vata, which is still commonly used because it's a really cool name. The sphincter, which would be called the hepatopancreatic sphincter, which closes off that tube and prevents both of those um, organs from ducting into the duodenum is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter, which is also known as the sphincter of Odi, another great name. Um, that's, found, that's found here too. The bile secreted by the liver is partly waste being excreted into the gastrointestinal tract for removal from the body and partly um, substances that help emulsify fats. So will help the digestion and absorption of fats in the small intestine. Whereas the, the exocrine cells of the pancreas, which is what most of the pancreas is made up of, those make enzymes that help digestion. And I mean, this is an interesting idea. The pancreas is making enzymes that digest proteins. You are largely made up of proteins. So you have to be careful about how you make these enzymes and keep them inert until they get into the gastrointestinal tract where they then become active and digest the proteins you want them to digest and not you. So if a gallstone forms and passes down the common bile duct and then blocks the hepatopancreatic duct, the hepatopancreatic ampulla, the hepatopancreatic... You get the idea, but if it blocks the duct down here, it's not just going to block bile passing from the liver to the duodenum, it's also going to block the exocrine secretions passing from the pancreas into the duodenum. Those enzymes will then become activated early and they'll start to digesting the pancreas and you'll get pancreatitis, which is very, very dangerous. So those concepts are important to the anatomy here, okay? Now, the major duodenal papilla, why is it called the major duodenal papilla? Well, this is the duodenum, it's a papilla, but in some people, oh, there is also a minor duodenal papilla. We've actually got one here. In the embryo, the pancreas, we actually have two pancreases form, and as everything rotates, they get brought together and they smush together. But those two pancreases each had a duct. And when they get smushed together, the two ducts merge and you have a single main pancreatic duct. But you may also have an accessory pancreatic duct. And that accessory pancreatic duct can open on its own into the duodenum a little bit proximal to the major duodenal papilla. So this would be the minor duodenal papilla. So if you have an endoscope and you're, you're looking down this tube and you find one papilla and another papilla, that's why. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, it might be like 10% of people have a functional 
accessory pancreatic duct, a minor duodenal papilla, something like that. I might be pulling that number out of thin air, or it might be right. Um, but the minor duodenal papilla, we're only going to see secretions from the pancreas entering the duodenum there, right? All right, um, and that is the descending duodenum. So the descending part of the duodenum then leads into the third part of the duodenum, which might be called the inferior part, and it's running from right to left here at about the level of the third lumbar vertebra. Um, or it might be called, so it gets called the, the inferior part, the horizontal part, or the third part of the duodenum. And it's running now anterior to the aorta and the inferior vena cava. And we can see some of the curve there. Even more interesting than that, look at this. These are the superior mesenteric vessels. So we have the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesenteric vein. And look, they're popping out from between the pancreas and the duodenum and running anterior to the third part of the duodenum. Neat. So we've got a lot of important anatomy close together in a small space here. That leads to the last part of the duodenum, the fourth part or the ascending part. So yeah, the duodenum curves around and not just that, it goes up again. So it ascends up towards the pancreas again. Uh, and <laughs> then we meet one of the hardest things to, to say out loud, where the duodenum meets the jejunum, this is called the duodeno jejunal flexure. I don't think I can say it any faster than that. So that's, that then becomes the jejunum, or jejunum, which then becomes the rest of the small intestine. And here, we find a structure that I, I never really talk about much, but my favorite surgeons always mention it whenever they're describing this region, and that's the ligament of trites, because it's a landmark for them. It's, it's, it's at that point here, at that flexure. So we've actually got a, can you see how it curves up and then drops back down again. The ligament of trites is also called the suspensory muscle of the duodenum, just adding further, con further confusion. Um, the term ligament gets used really badly all around the body. The ligament of trites is a weird structure. Skeletal muscle from the diaphragm runs down towards the duodenum and meets, blends with smooth muscle of the duodenum which then continues through and meets with connective tissues of the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac trunk. Here's the aorta, superior mesenteric artery, celiac trunk. So that's all covered in, connected, covered in connective tissue in life. So we have this structure that runs from the skeletal muscle of the diaphragm to blend with the smooth muscle of the duodenum to the connective tissue surrounding these arteries. And that's the suspensory muscle of the duodenum or the ligament of trites. And what it does is, it's at this duodeno jejunal flexure, it helps, I mean, support the duodenum, but it also when it contracts, it helps move the duodeno jejunal flexure and help open it and help pass contents from the duodenum to the jejunum. And that's it. That's the duodenum, except for the blood supply. I'm not gonna do lymphatics or nerves, but we'll do the blood supply because the blood supply is complicated and important. Arteries. So I said that up here, we've got the celiac trunk. If you know your embryology, the celiac trunk supplies structures of the foregut. And then we have the superior mesenteric artery. And the superior mesenteric artery supplies structures of the midgut. And the duodenum, the second part of the duodenum, where the bile duct and main pancreatic duct enter the duodenum, that defines where the foregut becomes midgut. So we have anastomoses between these arteries. The celiac trunk gives off a common hepatic artery, it's going to go to the liver, but that also gives off a gastroduodenal artery, which, um, yeah, I don't know how well we can see this. 
So that's going to supply blood to the gastro, the stomach, and the duodenal, the duodenum. That then forms pancreatico-duodenal arteries that... Oh, I've got another model, actually. Here we go, look at this. Uh, here's the pancreas with those ducts. Here's the duodenum. Okay. So there's the celiac trunk there. And that gives off an artery to the liver and the gastroduodenal artery, which is going to go to the duodenum and the stomach. The gastroduodenal artery then gives off pancreaticoduodenal arteries. And to be honest, there is a, there's an anterior and a posterior branch. And this is, whoop, this is the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. And this is the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery. So the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery comes from the celiac trunk. And the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery comes from the, the superior mesenteric artery. And they, fo they follow the curve around the duodenum. So they're supplying blood to the duodenum and other structures. So that's the blood supply to the duodenum. And that's a really tricky concept. So if you've got two arteries, so blood's flowing towards the duodenum from both of those arteries, and then it flows into the two pancreaticoduodenal arteries, but they're going to meet. So where does the blood go? Well, you've got to remember that what you can't see is you can't see all the smaller artery, arteries and arterioles, the smaller branches that are coming off the pancreaticoduodenal arteries, which then go to capillary beds which then go to the venous side of those capillary beds. So the blood that's flowing into that arch is also flowing out of that arch through many, many smaller branches and then around the duodenum and into the, the venous side. That's what happens in these arcades. We see these arcades throughout the body and it's, that's the principle, but it is a tricky one. And in terms of the venous side of things, the, the venous blood from the duodenum like the rest of the venous blood from the small intestine, will find its way to the portal vein and back to the liver. The veins follow the arteries, but they go back to the portal vein and the liver, not to the inferior vena cava. Okay, that's it. That's the anatomy of the duodenum from the perspective of the things I most commonly get asked. There is more to the microscopic structure and physiology and function of the duodenum, but I'm not doing that here. Um, we, we can identify the four parts. Hopefully you've got an idea in your head now of the, the shape of the duodenum, the idea that it's fixed in place on the posterior abdominal wall, nestled into the pancreas there, and we've looked at the blood supply and the ligament of trites or the suspensory muscle of the duodenum, as it's also called. Okay, all right? Okay, good, fine, done. Okay, good, see you next week.